Okay, so we just looked at the basics of entomotoxicology and some of the major methods by which we can use insects or use uh, basic toxicolo toxicology equipment to identify unknown substances in insects. Now I'm going to go into the particular interesting bits that happen when we're talking about uh, using bugs for toxicological analysis. So the advantages of using maggots instead of, say, body tissues for toxicology assessment can be seen in chromatography. Chromatographs uh, obtained from larval extracts present less contamination than those obtained from human body samples. This is especially true if the body samples are decomposed. So the maggots can actually be used, or the maggots actually will protect some of these uh, toxins in the body with and uh, keep them from being destroyed keep them from being overtly contaminated by decomposing substances or other substances in the body so it's a nice little package of drugs that you can use in maggot form so that works really really well now the toxins in tissues so let's say you have a body that person died of oh, a heroin overdose those toxins are going to be transferred through the food web Think about how this is going to work. Anything that goes into your body, whatever feeds on you is going to get those substances. And then whatever feeds on that thing is going to get those substances. And it's going to go along that route. So if somebody dies of a heroin overdose, they're going to have a huge amount of heroin in their body or a decent amount of heroin. The maggots are then going to get heroin in their body. Then we've got those beetles, remember, that come in and feed on maggots. We also have birds and spiders and various other things that will feed on those maggots. Ants. Then those ants ants and those spiders and those birds and those beetles are now going to have heroin in their body. And then anything that feeds on those spiders, birds, maggots, ants, beetles, whatever, are going to have heroin in their body. And it's going to continue on in that way. So toxins and tissues are transferred through the food web. And they usually start bioaccumulating in beetles that pre pre predate who on blowfly larvae. So bioaccumulation, that word I keep saying, this is the accumulation of substances such as pesticides or drugs that build up in an organism. So think about it as, you know, the more aspirin you take, the more aspirin you're going to have in your body, right? So if you have a maggot that is constantly feeding on uh, something with heroin, then it's going to get more and more heroin in its body. So this occurs when an organism absorbs, say, a toxic substance at a rate greater than that at which the substance is lost. So animals really don't have, especially insects, don't have the same physiological uh, abilities that we do to break down and excrete a lot of these substances. So they just bioaccumulate them. They accumulate them in their body. There's been extensive studies of this process. So, um, so uh, ecologists have been working to produce models that predict the rate of bioaccumulation in various species. And this is especially useful in environmental studies. So you're going to see this a lot in the environmental literature. Now, a study in the 1980s showed that it was possible to detect mercury in larvae, pupae, and adult insects re uh, reared on mer mercury-contaminated fish. So looking at all these different uh, Environmental studies looking for toxins or pesticides or whatever in the environment, one of the ways that we can see if it's affecting things other than its target organism is by looking for biological accumulate, uh, bioaccumulation in other species. Now, there was an interesting case study along these lines that saw an entomologist use similar procedures where the body of a woman was found in an advanced state of decay. She was covered in maggots and she was this in, in a rural region, uh, uh, inland of uh, an area. Now, there were distinctly low mercury levels pr present in the maggots. So this actually indicated a probable geographic origin of the victim, an area that was almost free of mercury contamination. So you're able to look at this body that had been dumped, look at the maggots that were feeding on that body and get a profile of contaminants that were in that woman. So they could narrow down the area where she lived because she doesn't have mercury in her body. 
She couldn't have been from an area with high mercury contaminants. So that sort of open-ended idea that we can use with this toxicological analysis really opens up a whole realm of information. So bioaccumulation is most potent in maggots because these are the things that are feeding directly on tissues. And then we'll see it next most potently in the predators feeding on the maggots. Now the substances that they're feeding on, they will carry through the life stages. So you, if they start feeding on them on in the first instar, you're going to see it in the second, the third instar, and the pupae and into the adults. But each molt and each metamorphosis will end up dispelling some of those ke uh, chemicals. This is actually one of the ways that insects have evolved to get rid of chemicals in their body is they will sequester it to their cuticles and when they molt it they just leave it in the exuvia or when they pupate they will leave it in that pupil casing so it doesn't affect that next developmental stage. So you can though test those exuvia and test those pupil casings for these chemicals. So the maggots themselves may have a very high concentration of the toxin, which will then lessen during the pupil stage and then lessen even further during the adult stage. However, adult flies are still useful in toxical toxicological analysis, but they're just going to have a much lower amount of toxin in their body. And just know that, know that there's that change. However, bioaccumulation also means that the toxin can be concentrated. So this bioaccumulation, because the maggot is feeding on a bunch of different tissues, because it's continuing to feed on these tissues that have this uh, toxin in it, it's going to start taking in more and more and more of this toxin. What that means then is we cannot at the moment, at least analyze maggots and determine how much toxin was present in a dead body. So we can't say, okay, this person died of an overdose because they had you know, this amount of heroin in their body because I found that amount in a maggot. It doesn't work that way. They're accumulating it. It's, it's additive there. So we can't say somebody would say over the legal limit for alcohol if we find alcohol in the maggot's body. It's more of a yes or no. We can only use them to determine if the substance was there or not. So we test for the substance. We say heroin was present. No idea of the, of the amount. No idea if that's what actually caused the death. I mean, that person could be super used to heroin. They were just slightly high, something like that. And that was just happened to be in their body and therefore the maggots have it. So at the moment, we can't do that. That would be a, certainly an interesting, say, PhD project, though, to see if we can't figure out the uh, uh, rate of bioaccumulation in certain maggots. Somebody do that, please. That'd be great. Thanks. Now, the ingestion of toxins can affect the growth of the development of insects. So there are a bunch of different types of um, chemicals that have been studied uh, and the effect of their growth on these different maggots. Here are the most common so starting with cocaine, maggots that are reared on tissues contaminated with cocaine show differing developmental times based on the amount of cocaine present in the tissues. So if the tissues have sublethal doses of cocaine, so that's somebody that is just snorting cocaine or whatever, just for funsies, the maggots are going to develop at approximately the same rate as maggots that did not ingest the drug. So there was no real significant difference between the control and the cocaine maggots. If the tissues have higher or lethal levels of cocaine, though, the maggots are going to develop much more quickly than those not exposed. So the pupil stage is the same, however, and mortality is not affected. So what this means is you're going to see larger maggots, maggots that develop more quickly than those that are not feeding on a body. So you may have a extended or an extended uh, time of colonization estimation based on their development rate because they're developing more quickly because cocaine was in the body. Morphine. Morphine results in a more rapid development and the production of larger maggots, regardless of the dose. So if, even if there was just a little bit of morphine in that body, those maggots are going to be bigger and they're going to be uh, much more rapid in their development. So again, you can have this extended time of colonization estimation when really they weren't dead that long. Now, the pupil period is also much longer, and it appears to be proportional to the amount of drug present in the tissues. So uh, there's an error of uh, up to about 29 hours uh, if these maggots are used to determine postmortem interval estimation. So that's over a day of time of colonization error if morphine is present. So you want to keep that in mind.
The same patterns are observed with heroin in maggots. So they have a faster developmental time and they produce larger maggots until a maximum maggot size is reached. This also caused overestimation of the postmortem interval. Now, when maggots were exposed to methamphetamines, the larvae seemed to develop very quickly, but the pupil mortality was really high. So those that didn't make it, that did make it through the pupil stage, failed to have viable offspring. So weirdly, meth, you know, caused them to grow a little more quickly, but then they died really easily and then they couldn't reproduce. So that was a weird thing that's going on there. I'm not sure what meth is doing to the reproductive system, but it's screwing it up, screwing it up. Amitriptyline. This is a common antidepressant. It actually showed no significant effects on most developmental stages, but it did cause a substantially longer post-feeding and pupil stage. So the larvae uh, went into that post-feeding stage and they just stayed there for a long, long time. So even if you have some good developmental tables for the pupil stage or the uh, post-feeding stage, you may overestimate the time of colonization again. And then the larval mortality was really high in amitriptyline deaths. Now, in blind studies used uh, attempting to calculate postmortem interval using maggots fed on drug-contaminated tissues, we found that there was a substantial underestimation of the uh, PMI or the time of colonization due to a general trend of maggots just speeding through their development in response to drugs. So things just were wrong. Now, we did look at pesticides as well. Pesticides, especially uh, parathion and malathion. This is an insecticide that is widely used in agriculture, and it can cause intoxication of humans and animals, either by inappropriate use or by deliberate uh, use in order to kill somebody or overuse for some reason. Now, this pesticide is detectable in various arthropod species of Diptera. Uh, it's in uh, Coleoptera, it's in Hymenoptera, it's in Isopoda, it's in Akari. So all of these were collected during all decomposition uh, phases of animals contaminated with the pesticide. The pesticide caused the arthropods to be abnormally small. So they are the opposite of these uh, drugs that were uh, taken in by humans. So these are much smaller and also pre presented as a deterrent to colonization at normal colonization sites, such as the mouth. So we didn't see these insects colonizing the, um, the uh, natural bodily openings, but it doesn't cause alterations on insect succession. Malathion, on the other hand, causes significant delay in insect oviposition and a significant change in the species of insects colonizing the remains. So there's a whole bunch of weird things that go on there. So this just sort of gives you a basic idea of the type of impact that drugs can have on insects. As of now, though, unless we have a paper that says specifically, you know, you're going to overestimate by 29 hours, you're going to underestimate by a day, there's really not much we can do. So what I do when I do my time of colonization estimations, I will ask for a drug report. And if there are drugs in the system, I can say that can change how these things grow. Just an FYI, but we don't know the amount. So here you go. So that, that end lends an air of, an, of uncertainty to your report. Now, if you are to use insects in toxicological analysis, you must collect them in a particular way in order to preserve the evidence. All collection equipment, it needs to be clean and if possible, washed in hot water or a sterilized. The tissue, the fluid, and the insects must be collected in vials that are free of preservatives or any external contamination. You don't want to add in something weird into your uh, analysis. The insects can be collected in the normal way, though. You can use forceps, you can use spoons or paintbrushes, nets, whatever. And in most cases, a refrigerated storage before analysis is recommended. So you want to throw them into a cooling area to sort of slow down any degradation of these chemicals. They need to be sampled in individual glass vials and labeled with all that proper information, taken to the laboratory where the larvae, larvae are killed by freezing rather than boiling, though. So we talked about boiling those maggots. You need to freeze these maggots in order to kill them in order to preserve that toxin. So the collection sites. Samples can be collected on the corpse where insects are commonly found. So uh, the natural bodily openings and wounds, in the clothes, or around the corpse. Basically, you're just going to use your same basic collection techniques and then move along from there. 
Now the analysis, many samples for analysis are best uh, sent in their original state. However, others will require additives in order to maintain them in optimum conditions until they reach the laboratory. Part of the sample should be stored in individual vials and refrigerated as your reference samples. Then the killed larvae should be rinsed in distilled water, uh, while the pupae need to be rinsed with uh, methanol prior to extraction to avoid any type of contaminants. The samples can then be prepared for analysis using whatever lab techniques or the uh, uh, standard operating procedures the lab you're at is looking for. Now, this preparation, again, depends on the substances to be analyzed. We're not going to go over those protocols because those vary from substance to substance. So if you start getting into this, you will be trained as a toxicologist and use those known toxicological methods just on the maggots instead of on human tissue. All right. So that ends our discussion of entomotoxicology. You let me know if you have any questions.